Hi everybody! So I was reading the third Caitlyn chapter in A Game of Thrones as part of my rereading series of videos and I couldn't help but think that there was something more to the events when Caitlyn was in Bran's room, when he's in a coma and an assassin comes in to kill him and she kind of fights him off until Bran's direwolf kills him. So this rereading video will be a little bit different and if it's your first time watching a rereading video be sure to hit subscribe to get the next ones as well. So let's just go back to the events in this chapter. The first part of the chapter starts eight days after the king and Ned and Arya and Sansa left Winterfell and Caitlyn is a total wreck and cannot function as the Lady of Winterfell because of Bran's accident. It's as if she is under some sort of spell. The second part is short and absolutely breathtaking and heart pounding with action. When the assassin comes in and the fight begins and ends. And the third part is the aftermath when Caitlyn seems like an entirely different person. Like the veil has been lifted off her eyes and she is no longer obsessed with staying with Bran. She doesn't even really care about staying with Bran after that, now all she wants to do is go to King's Landing and give the news to Ned. She will never see Winterfell again. It is clear to me that Caitlyn was somehow being controlled or compelled or manipulated by the three-eyed crow, Blood Raven, to make sure that she's there in the room when that assassin comes in to kill Bran. First of all, we have to like to realize that Bran had to get beyond the wall into the weirwood and meet the three-eyed crow. It has been foreseen, prophesied, dreamed about. And from the show we know that their present day Hodor was worked into in the past by future day Bran from the weirwood tree beyond the wall. So if Bran were to be assassinated this early in the story, then how did Hodor become Hodor, right? And we know that uh, the three-eyed crow orchestrated a lot of the events with Bran's fall being somewhat connected to the crows that were there on the tower and we know that he sent Jojen to get Bran so Bran had to get to that weirwood tree no matter what no human muggle assassin would ever be able to stop it and broadly speaking why I love this theory so much is that you can have an alternative reading to the same chapter you can read it as if she's overcome by maternal instincts and you can read it just as well that she's being compelled by a higher power Okay, so why do I think that Caitlyn's actions were controlled from afar? First of all, she seems clinically depressed. She can't deal with anything. She has not been able to leave the room at all. Not even for one second. Not to take a bath, not to take a shit, and not even to say goodbye to her husband and daughters. She keeps wondering, what if Bran needs me and I'm not there? Huh? You can't go outside for five minutes and say goodbye? What do you think could happen to your son in these five minutes? You can take a dump in another room. And Maester Lewin, he wants to talk to her about day-to-day -day government decisions, but she can't even think about anything else than Bran. Okay, so she's a worried mother, but she doesn't even think of her youngest son, Recon. He's only three. So that's an early hint that there's something more to this than just her being a mom. And every time she thinks about something else, her thoughts float back to Bran. As if some power has control over the situation. And then when Maester Lewin points out that they need to fill uh, the vacant position of Master of Horse, Caitlyn looks at him, sees a grey rat. She despises him. She goes ballistic. She doesn't notice that she's screaming. She doesn't see Rob come in. She's not entirely in control of her actions. She doesn't even notice that she fell to the ground. That's pretty extreme. And there was no apparent trigger other Howling of the direwolves. And the direwolves are, let's remember, creatures of the north. Their howling somehow drives Caitlyn further into darkness now that the drama is right around the corner. Rob, on the other hand, he calls the wolves howling singing and he knows they have a positive effect on Bran and he can tell which wolf is howling just by listening. But Caitlyn, their howls put her on the verge of collapse. She feels like she wants them all dead. And then she sees that her other son, Rob, there, he needs her. But she can't let go of Bran's hand. And when she finally does it, it says that she breaks free of it. And it says she could not move. Could not move. 
And this is the time when the wolves begin to howl and all hell breaks loose. The tension rises quickly, Caitlin is going crazy, she's screaming and shouting, something is happening, now the wolves are not barking anymore, now the dogs are barking, what is going on? A fire starts and she immediately thinks of Bran. Could be a natural instinct, or it could be the signal that makes her, without her knowledge, get ready to fight. The Winterfell library is burning, all the knowledge in these ancient books is now forever gone, up in flames. She looks at the window and at the fire and then, when she turned away from the window, the man was in the room with her. He uses this technique often. Have something just be there suddenly. Happen just like that, catching us unprepared like the characters are. When you're reading, you like sit up because something's going on. He is not telling us, he's showing us. So this is a great action sequence. Caitlin is like an animal. It's a tully. So that's a fish, but no, she acts like a wolf. She is not herself. There is a man there threatening her cub. And let's remember, this man is a skilled assassin who moved faster than Caitlyn would have believed. And when he yanked her head back to slit her throat, he did it so forcefully and with such intent and purpose that he pulled out several hairs. This is a man who has done this many a times before. He's not improvising. And yet, this skilled and trained assassin, he couldn't kill her. And she broke free by holding off the knife at her throat with her bare hands. His blade cut her hands almost to the bone. Yet she kept holding it with purpose and intent to match his own. And we're talking about an aristocratic woman who never dirties her hands, she has servants to wash and clean after her. And now she turned just like that into some kind of commando? Nah, come on, that's insane. So she bites off a part of his hand and he lets go, instinctively. He's a pro and she's soft and yet she does not let go when he cuts her hands to the bone and he lets go out of a bite. And after the bite, it says the taste of his blood filled her mouth. Oof, that sounds really dire wolfy. <laughs> it sounds like a brand wolf dream or warging or something. Come on, am I wrong? Am I wrong? You're not wrong, you're just an asshole. So this assassin is like repeating, you weren't supposed to be there. The man muttered sourly, no one was supposed to be here. Oh, Mr. Assassin, you are sadly mistaken. She was very much supposed to be there. When she's loose, she tells him, no, you can't. And can't is written in italics. It's not, no, I won't let you. It's, you can't. If it were just this word, then I would never even notice it. But the evidence is piling up. Because indeed, this assassin can't kill him. Bran is supposed to live. There's a divine plan. And all these events seem incredibly coordinated. She felt compelled to never leave the room, not for a brief moment, because of the obsessive feeling that something might happen to him. She stands guard even though she doesn't know that there is a specific threat. Then the wolves start howling right before the flames when, and they stop when the fire actually breaks out. So the dire wolves are in the know. They knew that something was going on. And at the same time, Caitlyn is acting like a person possessed, much crazier than before. So then the assassin is in position to assassinate Bran. And that's precisely when Bran's still nameless direwolf attacks him. <laughs> not a second too late, and not a second too early. He's there at the exact right time when Caitlyn basically could not protect Bran anymore. And when the direwolf takes out half of the assassin's throat with his teeth, it says... The blood felt like warm rain when it sprayed across her face. Wow. <laughs> wow. Oof, warm rain on her face. The blood? Is she someone who is used to blood? That doesn't sound like a tully. It sounds like a direwolf. Come on. Come on. So maybe... She was there because a dire wolf just needed someone to hold off the assassin for just a few seconds. Or maybe, and I prefer this option, 
perhaps she had to be there to later want to leave Winterfell and Bran so that in A Clash of Kings, Winterfell would be burned and Bran would be forced to go north. Because if Caitlyn was still in Winterfell, even if we accept the fact that Theon would have taken it and Ramsay and all that, after the burning of Winterfell, she would have taken Bran to the Vale, not to the north. Hmm? And also, it doesn't seem very plausible to me that this incredible plan that has been hatched for generations would hinge on Caitlyn holding off an assassin with her bare hands for a few seconds. No, no, no. There are too many moving parts here. If the wolves knew that something was up, why didn't Bran's wolf get there earlier? And why weren't he there before? Just to stand guard at the doorstep or whatever, on the stairs or something? Hmm? Why didn't they kill the assassin when he was hiding in the stables? Or when he first entered the room? It seems a needlessly elaborate plan to make Caitlyn go crazy enough so she'll be there when the assassin comes in just to give the direwolf enough time to save Bran. In my eyes, it was also like an initiation ceremony. She has her palms cut. Like in many initiations, she draws blood. And after Bran's wolf kills the assassin, she changes. She thanks the wolf. She wanted to kill him a moment earlier. She pats him and he licks the blood off her wounded hands. Then she starts to laugh hysterically. Does that sound normal to anyone? And she goes quiet only when the laughing died in her throat. Man, it sure sounds to me as if someone else is laughing for her. A maniacal evil mastermind can laugh. <laughs> you see, I already got tired after three seconds of this laugh. And she laughed endlessly. <sighs> and after that, she falls asleep for four days. Four days. Uh, she's recuperating from more than an assassination attempt on her and her son. Hmm? And that's not all. After all that, she thinks back to these last couple of weeks that she was, in my eyes, possessed, and it all seemed like a nightmare to her. Everything since Bran's fall, a terrible dream of blood and grief. A dream, right? And then she feels as if a great weight had been lifted from her. So this weight preceded the assassination attempt. Again, I love how his wording allows us to read it both as a grieving woman that is then relieved because her instincts were proven right, and at the same time, it works for the theory that Blood Raven was the puppet master. But another hint for me that it's not just a grieving woman is that after the fact, she feels ashamed of her actions. She's not saying to herself, I had a feeling that this would happen. It's good that I did it. No. Even though it led to her being there when her son needed her, she still feels ashamed. She doesn't feel like herself. Okay, so what do you think? What do you think? Please give me your take in the comments. Let's wrap it up. There's some more exciting stuff in this chapter about Rob and about Ned. But I wanted this video to be about Caitlyn. So I'll just end the video now, not to make it too long. But if you feel like you want an extra video about the other stuff in the chapter that is not included in the video, please mention in the comments. And if enough of you want it, I'll definitely do it. And I would like to ask you that if you listened all the way to here, it means that you like the videos of the rereading series. So please consider going to our Patreon page on patreon.com slash gotacademy to support the channel so I'll be able to keep this series going on for a long, long time. This could be like a five-year project. So if you're into that, I need to know. <laughs> And I'll need your support to get, it, uh, to get it all the way through the end. So thank you for watching. I'll see you all next time. Bye, everybody.